Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we are going to look at two major divisions in terms of how and where agricultural goods are produced. These two divisions are between subsistence and commercial agriculture. Let's begin with subsistence agriculture, which is any of several agricultural economies in which crops are grown or livestock are raised nearly exclusively for local or family consumption. Essentially, subsistence agriculture is when the people who are growing the food are the ones who eat the food that is grown. Within subsistence agricultural systems, production is fairly minimal and it is not intended for sale at market or to make a profit. It is meant to feed the family. Now, that isn't to say that subsistence farmers won't sell anything. They may sell a little bit of whatever surplus they generate, but it may go to pay government taxes rather than say for profit. Since subsistence farmers are producing food for their families rather than for sale, they tend to be in more peripheral areas and may live in fairly isolated communities. Subsistence agriculture relies primarily on human labor, with many people engaged in farming, as there are, is very little capital to invest in machinery, livestock, or large plots of land. Throughout history, most farmers were subsistence farmers, so they can feed themselves and their community. But during the 1900s, the percentages of subsistence farmers declined as countries benefited from the second agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution and began to transition to commercial agriculture. However, in many periphery countries, such as Nepal or Chad, Agriculture remains the primary employer, with approximately 80% of the population engaged in farming. And in Chad, agriculture still represents over half of the country's gross domestic product. Contrast that with Canada, where only 1.6% of its GDP is generated from agriculture, and only 2% of its people are employed in the primary sector. So, is primary sector labor force a good indicator of development? Yes, yes it is. Primary sector labor force tends to be higher in periphery countries like Nepal or Chad and lower in core countries like Canada. And it isn't just Canada that exhibits those characteristics. In the United States, total agricultural production is at an all-time high, but the proportion of the labor force in agriculture is at an all-time low. In 1950, one farmer in the United States produced enough to feed 27 people. Today, one farmer in the U.S. produces enough to feed 144 people. That is because the farmers in Canada and the United States and much of the global core are commercial farmers, which is a term used to describe large scale farming and ranching operations that employ vast land bases, large mechanized equipment, factory type labor forces, and the latest technology. As the definition explains, commercial farmers have access to lots of capital to invest in machinery like tractors, cultivators, and milking machines. This is another good indicator of development because these machines are expensive, capital intensive. So we see higher rates of machines in MDCs and lower rates in LDCs. Commercial farmers can buy the newest and best hybrid and genetically modified seeds, as well as chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. They will invest in large storage and processing facilities to reduce the loss of their products. 
commercial farmers will spend lots of money to increase productivity, which in turn yields tremendous profits. And that is the main goal of commercial farmers, to maximize their profits. Commercial farmers grow crops that are sent to marketplaces, both regionally and globally, so the farmers can make the most money. So infrastructure is especially important to commercial farmers so they can get their crops to market while they're still valuable. Commercial agriculture is characterized by smaller workforces because much of the work is done using large mechanized farming equipment, which in turn means that relatively few people can work huge tracts of land because machinery makes it easier and more efficient. Since the 1960s, the use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides have increased considerably throughout the world. This has led to dramatic increases in productivity. For example, wheat and rice have more than doubled due to the increased usage of chemicals in agriculture. At the same time, though, this has increased the risk to both humans and the physical environment. As we mentioned previously, throughout much of human history, most farmers were subsistence farmers. But the second agricultural revolution, along with the industrial revolution, began to shift more farms toward commercial farming, with the focus shifting to maximizing profit. We also see the influence of colonialism on the shift toward commercial agriculture. In an earlier lecture, we noted that one of the reasons that European countries sought out colonies was for resource extraction. Subsistence agriculture does not generate enough surplus to ship raw materials back to industrialized countries of Western Europe. So many colonies had plantations established that specialized in monoculture, or the dependence on a single agricultural commodity. Plantations cultivated huge tracts of land to generate the greatest yield. For example, Cotton grown in Egypt, Sudan, India, and other countries colonized by Europe was purchased cheaply, then imported to European factories and made into clothes, many of which were then exported and sold, often in the very colonies where the cotton had been grown in the first place. So colonies served as both the source of raw materials and an expanded market to sell to. And those decisions still have an impact today. Ghanaians still raise cacao. Mozambicans still grow cotton. And Sri Lankans still produce tea. More than half of the revenue raised from agricultural exports in Zimbabwe come from tobacco. Likewise, rubber in Cote d'Ivoire, cotton in the Central African Republic, and coffee in Burundi illustrate that plantation crops still represent a considerable proportion of the export economies of former colonies. So one of the places that we can examine quantitative data associated with subsistence and commercial agriculture is in the size of farms. Generally, subsistence farms are smaller and commercial farms are bigger. The best places to see this are in Asia and North America, respectively. Rice paddies in Asia are quite small, run by local families for community consumption. Fields of wheat, corn, and soybeans in North America are massive. Relatively few farmers operate these massive tracts of land with lots of machinery in order to maximize production and generate the greatest possible profit. However, shifting cultivation and nomadic pastoralism are forms of subsistence agriculture that occupy huge land areas, while market gardening is a form of commercial agriculture that occupies relatively small land areas. So there must be another factor beyond just simply subsistence and commercial practices that dictate how much land an agricultural activity is likely to take up. And that brings us back to intensive and extensive systems of agriculture and the bid-rent theory. Let me start by introducing you to the bid-rent curve. 
a bid rent curve can be used to indicate the starting position for each land use relative to a central place, as well as where each land use would end. According to the bid rent theory, the land closest to that central point was more valuable because it was more accessible to more people. So there would be more competition driving up the cost of that land. So farmers who use that land must do so intensively so they could produce enough on a relatively small amount of land. Remember, intensive agriculture like rice farming, dairying, and market gardening means that a farmer gets a higher yield per acre. Well, farmers closer to the market wouldn't have as much land because that land was expensive. Therefore, they would have to use that land more intensively. Now, in order to read this graph, the y-axis represents profit. The x-axis represents distance from the market. So notice that each of the colored lines declines in profit with increasing distance from market. So when does a farmer switch to a different crop? When they can make more profit from doing so. So when the uppermost line on the graph intersects with the next uppermost line, that indicates where it is more profitable to switch crops and thus we see a change in zones. So farmers will use more extensive forms of agriculture farther from the center of the model because they can. Extensive forms of agriculture do not yield as much per acre, so they need more land to produce enough food to eat or as may be the case, to sell. So an agricultural practice that is closer to a market with more expensive land will use land more intensively and those farms might be smaller as a result, which is exactly what we see with market gardening, even though it's a form of commercial agriculture. Conversely, a subsistence form of agriculture that requires lots of land, like shifting cultivation or nomadic pastoralism, would locate in more isolated areas that are less accessible with little, if any, cost to occupy the land, and the land areas could be massive. And that is where we will end our conversation for tonight. Have a wonderful evening, and I'll see you back in class.